Hello, I'm happy to be joined once again with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal for another SMC Somerville Journal News Roundup. How are you doing, Julia? I'm pretty good today, Dave. Thanks. How are you? I'm hanging in there. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, uh, this is a a segment where we kind of go down a list of topics that are on Somerville's minds at the moment. Um, And as always, forefront of everybody's mind is the COVID pandemic. So why don't we start with that as we have been doing um, and talk about some of the some of the numbers here in Somerville and uh, around the state. Awesome. Yes. Um, So the city is continuing to update their COVID dashboard twice a week um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So that remains a pretty kind of updated resource. Um, As of Tuesday, October 6th, um, there were 1,296 confirmed positive cases, 102 probable positive at the moment, um, 1,214 recovered, and 42 confirmed fatalities. Um, Well, of course, that's awful. Um, That number hasn't gone up in a little bit. So that's a good a good thing. Um, and Somerville's data is remaining pretty consistent. Um, when you look at the kind of city COVID dashboard, you can see kind of the curve uh, that happened in April and May. And we've been pretty steady um, and go, trending downwards um, in the past month or so. Um, and as we have almost every week now, um, or every time we've uh, done this, been looking at the state COVID dashboard, which is a really helpful tool and kind of visually seeing where the whole state is at and where especially where Somerville's at in relationship to like Cambridge and Medford and, you know, our surrounding communities. Um, so if you take a look at that, um, the past couple weeks that we've recorded these, um, Somerville has been in yellow, um, which essentially means um, that there's been four to eight cases per 100,000. It's just kind of a rate, um, but trending kind of pretty steady. Um, but Somerville is now green. Um, So the worst is red, then yellow, then green, then kind of gray. Um, So we're actually doing even better. So we're trending lower. Um, There's been no big change. We're continuing to test at a really good rate. Um, Testing is still available through CHA at the Assembly Square site. Um, And that is for anyone, even if you are are not displaying symptoms, if you visited family and need to take a precautionary test, you can call and make an appointment. Um, I've done so on many occasions. (laughs) Um, So that kind of continues. Um, And if you take a look um, at this map, um, you can see kind of it broken down by case count, two week case count. Um, You can see how things have been changing, the total number of tests in the last 14 days, the total tests period, which is, I think it's interesting, actually, the total number of tests is now over 80,000, which is about the number of citizens. Not to say that there's been one test per citizen. Maybe mm. people like myself are getting tested multiple times. Um, but it's still a pretty a pretty good testing rate. Um, so this is just kind of like something to continue keeping an eye on. Um, but there, there's a lot of data. I mean, if you look at the communities around us, um, more communities are starting to be red. So more communities are kind of trending upwards in cases, um, while others are trending downwards, some are remaining steady. Um, there's a lot of, um, there are many differences between how communities are approaching this. Of course, many communities are dealing with different things. Some have colleges and universities like some of them, some don't, some are doing school in person, some aren't, or a hybrid plan. Um, so there's a lot, right, that goes into this. And Boston being in the red, that's that's new. That is new. Uh, yeah, which is this this kind of interesting because I think, um, so the state, right, so Baker's kind of phase reopening plan is moving forward into, I think it's step two of phase three. And um, several communities, including Somerville and Boston, have said that they are not going to be moving forward with that. Um, that they don't believe it's safe at this time. And while Somerville is remaining pretty steady, um, they're kind of citing that like these changes, like we're not ready for these, for these changes to happen. Um, And Boston mayor Marty Walsh announced that he would be kind of keeping um, staying back in that phase one. Uh, I mean, phase three, step one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Another tool that I came across and we want to encourage uh, viewers to visit uh, mass.gov. Um, and their their COVID section, you know, has a list of resources. They have a, a similar dashboard uh, broken down by by city, and then that's where you can get access to this interactive map, um, mm-hmm. as well as going to somerville.ma.gov uh, to see it on the the local level. Mm-hmm. Um, something else that I pointed out to Julia was um, the New York Times has been doing 
um, a really good kind of similar COVID dashboard and kind of aggregating information that way. And one thing that I wanted to point out was this um, on the Massachusetts uh, page, the latest data that they have on Massachusetts, um, that they have cases connected to a bunch of uh, various places, colleges and universities, prisons, nursing homes, and other. So just kind of focusing on, on where clusters are happening. Mm -hmm. And so within Massachusetts, there's uh, 682 cases at 48 schools. Mm -hmm. And if we scroll down to um, and focus on, on Tufts University, which is partly uh, in Medford, partly in Somerville, um, and a lot of students live in Somerville, we see that there's 28 cases um, at Tufts University. Um, and then, you know, just looking at also at um, area um, institutions, you know, uh, if we go to MIT, for instance, uh, there's 26 cases listed there. And Harvard, um, there's 58 cases listed there. And uh, I only mention those because, you know, uh, Somerville, um, th those students could be living and, and working in Somerville uh, and passing through. So there is a, a kind of correlation between, um, um, not a correlation, sorry, there is a link to um, the importance of keeping track of, of, of these numbers uh, within uh, universities and colleges. Absolutely, yes. And that is something we're going to take a look at. Um, it's an issue I'm following up on currently. Um, Tufts has recently announced that they're going to be offering some limited community testing for kind of residents and immediate abutters of the Tufts campus in Somerville and Medford. Um, so they, you know, they're kind of taking this community action, but I was still kind of curious, you know, they, there was a lot of um, controversy over their plan, whether or not it was going to be effective. And here we are, um, as we're recording, it's October 7th, they've been moving students onto campus since mid-August. Um, so I kind of want to know kind of where where things are at, how are things going, are they feeling confident with their testing rate, um, and just, yeah, what are they seeing? So that's an issue that we'll be following up on. I don't have a story at the moment, but that will be coming out in the next week or so. Great. Thanks for that, Julia. And then uh, moving on to the election, November 3rd is the actual um, election day, yes. but, you know, there's, there's plenty of dates to keep track of before that time. Um, so which of these dates do you want to mention? <laughs> sure. So I just bring this up because I think it should be on everyone's mind because yes, like, you know, I feel like in typical years, the elections on November 3rd, we're not really thinking about it as much in early October. Like we're like, oh, you know, we'll go vote in a month, but this year is anything but typical. So there's <laughs> lots to keep in mind. Um, especially because many people move this time of year. I, I just want to bring this up because sometimes people don't know that they have to update their voter registration by a certain date in order to vote in in their local, in their election, like in the election. So they need to update their address. Um, they need to en make sure they're en enrolled. Um, so just like some things to keep in mind. Um, many people, I think, well, every person received a vote by mail application Um that was something that was mandated by the Secretary of State. Um, I returned mine, and when I returned it before the primary election, I checked that I also wanted a mail-in ballot for November. So many people I know have already done that. Um, but something to just remember, so if your voter registration, like if you are not registered to vote or you're unsure, check. Um, if you're some of a resident, you need to return and kind of submit all of that by October 24th, which is a Saturday. Um, you can download everything you need on the Somerville website at somervillema.gov slash elections. Um, if you need to get a vote by mail application, um, if you haven't already requested a ballot, your application, your, so your application, not your ballot, your application must be returned to the elections department by end of day on Wednesday, October 28th. Um, so just again, some things to keep in mind. Um, ballots are going to start being mailed out next week on October, so the week of October 12th. Um, but this is all just like, there's a lot this year, <laughs> a lot to keep in mind. I know that there's a lot of, um, kind of, there's been some kind of skepticism around safety of mail-in ballots. And during the primary election, Somerville kind of helped residents out by placing ballot boxes all over the city, which means that if you requested a mail-in ballot, it will be mailed to you. Um, but when you fill it out, you don't have to mail it back in. You can hand deliver it to one of these ballot boxes. There's one right outside City Hall. And then I think there are nine other ones spread across the city. I'm not going to list all of them, but we have a list up on our website. Somerville has a list on their website and you'll see them if you walk around. They're these kind of like blue mailbox looking things with a yellow kind of vote in the ville thing on it. 
an official seal on the front. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that if that's something you're nervous about. Um, so that's kind of just like general election information that everyone needs to know. <laughs> Make sure that they are able and eligible to vote um, in this election. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to bring up was that there are actually two ballot questions um, on on the ballot this year. Um, many people, I, I don't know about you, Dave, but I received like the kind of like red voting booklet. Do you get one of these? Yeah. Yeah. So if you look through that, which I love, it's like a little magazine um, that has a ton of information about these two ballot questions. Um, so I highly recommend, you know, looking through that. You should have received one. Yeah. Um, so the first question um, is regarding, it's called the, it's right to repair. That's kind of what it's being referred to as. And this has to do with um, kind of automobile data. Um, a lot of newer vehicles have you know pretty fancy systems um, and they collect a lot of data about kind of what is going on in the car in this kind of central computer system um, but the way that that is it's it's pretty monitored at this moment so often if um, you know those vehicle owners need to get repairs um, that relate to that system or even other systems that are kind of run by that um, in the car they have to go to the dealership because the dealership is the only like thing that can kind of unlock and access that data. Mm. And what this question is regarding is it's saying that's not fair. That doesn't kind of allow enough competition in the market. Um, and also it means that these kind of small auto shops are always behind. Like they can't, they can't repair newer cars because they don't have access to that data. Um, so I spoke with a couple local auto body shop owners who are in support of this question. Um, so a yes vote gives those independent repair shops access to this data called like telematics data. I'm um, going a no vote would keep it as is. Um, so, you know, it's, it's complex, of course, like it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, but I did notice kind of when I was speaking with these local auto body repair shops, they were saying like, you know, we, we're going to need to buy, you know, software and systems in order to even access this too. Like we're going to have to make investments so that we can repair your cars as well. And what this means is you're going to be able to get, you're going to have more options for where to get your car fixed. You're going to have cheaper options for where to get your car fixed. Um, and it just makes sense like for the consumer, for businesses, for everyone, it's just more convenient. It's more equitable, et cetera. Um, but there is an argument that's being used. This is why I really wanted to note on this one. Um, there's an argument being used by the kind of proponents for voting no, that expanding access to this data will actually increase the risk of um, stalking and domestic violence. Um, because they say that um, if more people can access data on where people go, where people have been, um, that that could present a risk. Um, so I wanted to bring this up because um, a position from Jane Doe Inc., which is the Massachusetts Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence, was used in that red booklet as kind of part of the justification for voting no. Right. And what I found interesting is I, I'm actually a former intern of Jane Doe, just to be completely candid. I'm an intern there in college. Um, and they released a statement on Facebook um, a few weeks after that was sent out saying, um, we are not taking an official position in this kind of yes versus no debate. But they did say that they don't believe a yes vote would uniquely compromise survivor safety in the manner that was portrayed in this booklet and by those proponents. Mm -hmm. So they, they didn't say whether it was like yes or no, but I think they were kind of trying to remove that position from this conversation. Right. Um, right so I just right. wanted to kind of mention that because it was used in this booklet that was literally sent to every voter in Massachusetts. Um, and it's just, you know, something that, you know, while it's a very helpful resource, it doesn't mean your education on these issues should end there. For right. example, when I first read that, I was like, oh my goodness, like, cause I, you know, very concerned about that issue and very engaged in that issue. And I was like, wow, I really need to learn more about this because I don't want to vote yes. And then have this kind of consequence happen. Right. So I, when that was kind of how I found this and it really helped me because now I feel much more educated about the issue and a little bit more confident about how I'm going to vote. So I encourage you to read the booklet, but don't let your research stop there. Right. Um, so that's kind of the first question. Um, and the second question is ranked choice voting, <laughs> which is very, very controversial. Um, there have been conversations about this in Massachusetts for many years. Um, so this, um, this is kind of on the ballot this November. Um, some people I think are 
familiar with it. Some people are less familiar with it. Um, this was specifically applied to federal and state races, except the U.S. president and races that result like in a single winner. So a yes vote would would support kind of pl- replacing our current system with the ranked choice voting and a no vote opposes that. So we would keep our existing system. Um, and if this passes, this would be implemented for the primary and general elections in 2022. Um, so this would kind of, it would happen. Um, there, there's a lot about this issue to kind of un- unravel. I, I think an interesting thing is that ranked choice voting doesn't always look the same. Um, there are different kind of forms of ranked choice voting. Um, for example, Cambridge uses a form of ranked choice voting, um, but that isn't exactly what would happen for our state and federal elections. Um, for example, this would only c- come into play when there were three or more candidates competing for a single seat election, um, mm-hmm. which is we have such a kind of bipartisan system at the moment that that is not always the case. So just because we pass this doesn't automatically mean that it would always apply. Um, but it's definitely an, an interesting issue. Um, we have a story up about it that goes really in depth. Um, there's definitely information in that booklet though I encourage you to look further. Um, so yeah, just definitely make sure you're kind of ready to make a decision on those questions when you receive your ballot. Great, great information there. And I have to say, like, I'm seeing more TV ads about question one than question two. And, um, and you know, just the, the interested parties uh, that um, would be affected by um, question one passing, you know, they, they, they're all, they're all, uh, they're all in for their positions. Sure. <laughs> So yes, do some research and um, that and make a very uh, fact-based decision. <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, Somerville has a couple of new murals, uh, both related to Black Lives Matter. Um, they were painted over the last couple of weeks. Um, we had a camera there at Magoon Square, um, so we, we have some footage that we're happy to share um, on our that you can see on our website that you can see on our channel of. Uh, the volunteers from Just Us Somerville, uh, the recently formed group uh, that uh, uh, made up of people of color within Somerville who took up the mayor's challenge uh, when the mayor declared uh, that racism was a public health emergency. They formed a group saying, uh, yes, it is. Here we are. <laughs> uh, and then they uh, they painted this mural in Magoon Square. And you let me know about another uh, mural that went up that same weekend. Yes. Um, so this is why I think this story is interesting. Um, absolutely, I want to just first and foremost acknowledge the work of Just Us Somerville. They're really, um, they're doing a lot. I've spoken to them a lot over the past few months, and there's still a lot more to do in terms of all these conversations that were started around police review and this new kind of Department of Racial and Social Justice. Um, but they've um, they've been doing a lot, and I'm really excited to see what else they accomplish um, and where else they lead us. Um, but yes, um, so I think this was on uh, Sunday, September 27th. Um, there were two murals across the city from each other that were painted at the same time. Um, one of them was the just stunning uh, Black Lives Matter mural that was painted in Magoon Square by Just Us Somerville and the artists that they um, involved. Um, this was a, a really big mural um, with um, faces painted in as well of George Floyd and others um, who were victims of police violence. Um, and really, um, that it seemed like they had a great event. They had a great day for it. Um, and this was kind of just put together, um, in an effort to elevate the voices of minorities. You know what I mean? This was part of more of their work to kind of bring attention to this issue. Um, while across the city, um, a much smaller mural on a very small street, um, on Oak street, kind of outside of Inman and Union Squares, um, was painted in response to some racist vandalism that has recently been kind of, um, perpetuated against this um, neighborhood. So we've been reporting on this, but um, starting in, I think, late August, there were some incidents of racist vandalism. Um, I think we have chatted about this a little bit before. Um, There were some incidents at Trina Starlight Lounge in Inman Square, um, some graffiti on a residence um, right around the Oak Street mural. Um, There was some racist graffiti on um, kind of fences uh, near the Union Square development on the Sacramento Street underpass. Um, And just, it all seemed kind of concentrated in this 
area. You know, so I think um, when I was speaking with residents about this, um, they said that they just they felt moved to do something that they you know they weren't okay with it, but it didn't it didn't feel like enough to just not be okay with it. That they they wanted to kind of mark their neighborhood with something that they felt was inclusive and welcoming. And that would stand against the messages that had been painted on their homes and on in, in their neighborhood. Um, so I just I bring this up because I think it's interesting. Um, you know, they there isn't a ton of up, you know, updated information about the perpetrator. Um, the police are investigating it. Um, they have um, some leads in the Trina Starlight case. They don't necessarily know that it's connected to the other cases, but there is a detective assigned um, and someone is looking into this. Um, so we'll, you know, definitely follow up on this, but there hasn't been, as far as I know, there hasn't been an incident in a few weeks now, um, but, you know, we will see. Very good. Um, yeah, it's great to see, great to see that message being, um, you know, spread throughout the city. Um, yeah, Black Lives Matter. Say it often. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, to wrap up our, our, our news roundup here, uh, we have a couple of um, really interesting news items. One about some uh, language and jobs training yeah. that is happening at Bunker Hill Community College that um, a local Main Streets organization is uh, participating with. Um, so can you let us know a little more about that? Of course, so I just thought this was really cool. Um, I, I learned that um, East Somerville Main Streets applied for a grant um, from the Somerville Jobs Creation and Re Retention Trust Fund. Um, and this grant kind of brings together uh, several community organizations, including the Welcome Project, the Community Action Agency of Somerville, or CAS, and Bunker Hill Community College, um, as well as East Somerville Main Streets, to kind of make possible um, this Ingl English language and jobs training for English language learners. And what this looks like is that um, they have funding to support this training for 100 students. Um, this first semester has already started. So currently there are 48 students enrolled, so almost exactly 50-50, and they're enrolling for next semester. Um, instruction is all online at the moment because Bunker Hill is online at the moment, um, but instruction is being given through their language institute. Um, but what I found really cool about this is that, um, well, you know, language training is great. Um, you know, it's improving access. It's um, supporting equity um, in our economy. Um, it's not just that. Um, students who are a part of this program, they are students at Bunker Hill in the sense that they have access to support services through Bunker Hill Community College. Then they are also supported by the Community Action Agency of Somerville, which can support them with employment, which can support them with housing, you know, resources, whatever else they need. They have access to support through the Welcome Project, which is Somerville's premier immigrant organization. Many of these students are immigrants or are part um, in families of immigrants. And there's a number of support systems that exist there. But um, one that a, a few people mentioned who I was speaking with said that, for example, if a student applies to the program and they maybe don't have enough of a basis in English, the Welcome Project has beginner English classes and different levels. So they might refer them to the Welcome Project for now and then invite them to the training next semester. Um, and then East Somerville Main Streets is, you know, this kind of Main Street um, business nonprofit organization, right? So they can connect people with businesses when people graduate from this program with their customer service and English language training. They can say, hey, who's hiring and kind of connect them with these businesses. And if any of these people in the training are maybe entrepreneurs, um, they can help them maybe start a business in East Somerville or in one of Somerville's communities. Um, so I just thought this was a really positive, really kind of innovative way of kind of bringing, bringing organizations together to support residents. Um, this resource is specifically for some of our residents who are over 18 and who do have to show that they are from a low income household. Um, but even though the first semester has started, it's October, you could start thinking about maybe you wanted to do the next semester. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, really amazing connections that can be brought out of this. And just the people I was speaking with who are kind of leading the program are just all lovely. Um, so maybe you'll make new friends. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's great. And I just want to single out Jen Atwood, who is yeah. the executive director of East Somerville Main Streets. Um, she does an amazing job. Um, the, the Main Streets organizations in Somerville are just so... Uh, proactive about about furthering um, you know the the 
the need, the, the agendas and the needs for uh, small businesses within their districts. And, you know, that includes a lot of immigrant run businesses. So kudos to, to Jen Atwood uh, for this. Um, and finally, <laughs> uh, you were able to speak with a, a local couple that ended up on a reality TV show. What's, what's that all about? Yes, this is just fun. Um, so yes, um, I spoke a few weeks ago with Alana Folsom and Leo Brown, who are a Somerville couple who ran the amazing race. <laughs> now, to be honest, this is not a show that I have ever seen. Of course, I've heard of it, but um, I was really excited to talk to them when I kind of saw the kind of press information coming out about this. I was like, ooh, like that sounds like cool, a cool thing. Um, so the, the season premieres on October 14th. So they weren't able to reveal a lot of information about like how far they got, whether they won, who knows. Um, but it was really cool talking to them because they, um, you know, it, it's reality TV, right? So they kind of told me all about the casting process and they, at the time, um, what I just thought was hilarious, um, on their second date, they watched The Amazing Race together. I guess Alana had been a fan since she was young and Leo was just kind of liked reality TV and their roommates were like, oh my God, you guys would be so good on the show. And then I think like six months in, they were accepted like they applied like very quickly and they were cast as like the newly dating team alana said they pitched themselves as team tinder it's <laughs> 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 really funny but i guess they were informed that tinder was not going to get free advertising for that um so they they said that the first day of the race was their 10 month anniversary oh wow so they were like brandy new on this which i thought was so funny but this was several years ago i, I think the season was filmed in 2018 and its release was delayed once um, COVID hit. So they said that um, it was just, you know, this kind of new thing they both wanted to try together and they were really excited to kind of test their relationship and see how they did. Um, and apparently must have gone pretty well because they got married a few weeks ago and now have a house and two cats in Winter Hill and are just like lovely, you know, really fun, seem like really fun people. Um, so whether or not you're a fan, um, two hometown humans are going to run the amazing race or they ran it. And now we get to watch them run it. Um, so I just, you know, it's something fun. Um, we, I'm going to have a feature up on that shortly and yeah, it premieres next week. So if you're, if you're into that, you should check it out and cheer them on. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you, Julia. And if, if anybody is interested in uh, any of the topics that we talked about, um, you should go to the Somerville journals website at somerville.wicketlocal.com. Um, you can also visit us at Somerville Media Center at somervillemedia.org. Um, so thanks again, Julia. It was great thanks chatting having me. with you. <laughs> you too. And um, everybody stay safe out there and we'll see you next time. Okay.